The best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune in to Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8 p.m. here only on Mersey Radio. So right now what we're going to do, now we're going right over to Derek Shelmerdy. Now Derek Shelmerdy, what I've written down here, where, where I can see my wonderful pieces of writing, which, I, 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 yes, I've got it here. I've got Derek Shelmerdine, music maestro, especially of the Mersey Beat era. And this is where we're going over to. Now, you just heard, a, 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 you know, a song by uh, one of the lesser known uh, bands at the time, because I remember them, I remember seeing them live, uh, as I was at, uh, explaining before. And it was Dizzy Miss Lizzy. Now, I remember the Beatles playing this. It's the only ever time I ever... Um, uh, listen to a recording of Dizzy Miss Lizzy and it was by the Beatles now I didn't know that it was the Escorts to be honest who, who actually recorded it and it's absolutely fantastic and, and you know just listening to it as well uh, brought back great memories oh, wonderful memories might I add so I'm going right over to Derek because even in Derek Hi oh, Frank, good to speak to you again. Oh yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. It's it, it's strange, isn't it? You know, because the last time we were talking, uh, lots of people were saying this is a great show. You know, with Derek because it brought back wonderful memories for them. You know, to uh, you know be associated with uh, you know the old bands going back then. And when we said when we said the last time, because. Um, we played, uh, I forget who we played, and I love this song, and I oh, forget who it was, oh, forget, uh, and, uh, please stay, you know the, the song, please stay, remember that? Please stay. Yeah, yeah, well, I love that song, and people were saying they remembered uh, the song as well, because the lads sang it with passion and everything else, and just like myself, yeah. so I've always said that, please stay Oh, don't go. You know, you know what I mean. I'm not going to start yep. singing, is it? But and you said we'll we'll talk about some of the obscure bands and some of the stuff that you've sent me through is absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. The likes of what you're saying about Paul McCartney, you know, uh, the who was on, uh, you know, the, the escorts and he was playing a tambourine on one of the. You know, the, 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 the right. absolutely right. amazing. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it was such a fabulous era. I mean, you know, I'm talking about uh, Please Stay. I mean, it was the, the Prime James covered that in uh, in Liverpool. It's a Drifters song originally. Brian James one, they, they actually turned down Brian Epstein's offer of managing them. And not only that, that song's produced by Joe Meek, legendary uh, producer. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that might have been the last hit he had, because they did have a, a couple more singles uh, produced by uh, Joe as well. I think with the this Lizzie beat, the, I mean, the Beatles famously recorded that. That's yeah. a, a Larry Williams song from 58. There's not many people were uh, writing their own stuff um, at that time. Most of uh, the, the songs that were being made, certainly the ones that were hit by, uh, in the Mersey Theatre, they're mostly... Uh, Covers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about uh, you know the likes of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes? And I used to go and see them on the Iron Door, and they they were phenomenal. But also, yeah. I think one of the resident well, I think I know that one of the resident bands was the Searchers as well. But the likes of Rory right. Storm and the Hurricanes had such a phenomenal following. That's right. I I think it was a bit of a lottery. Um, as to which bands went on to uh, great success and which didn't. We were just talking there the, about the Denisons and, you know, releasing uh, Walk and the Dog, which I remember quite quite well. It was one of these uh, uh, memories that you have, you know, especially like the whistling and everything, Walk and the Dog. And, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and and this this is all floods of back, as I said. But yet, what what gets me is that they actually refused to record 
Oh my, oh my love, and I will send to you. Did he actually refuse that Lennon and McCartney song, which really could have uh, catapulted them into international stardom? And do you think that you know, with the likes of refusing this, this could have been a, a, a catalyst for the, the recording um, prowess, shall we say? Oh, it, it could well have been. I think they'll probably look back, definitely look back on that as um, probably the biggest mistake they um, they ever made. It, it could have been that they just wanted to um, make it on their on their rather than on the back of uh, of uh, a Beatles uh, Lennon McCartney song. But you know, the, if they'd looked to uh, Billy J. Kramer, I mean, he did uh, reasonably well out of Lennon McCartney songs. I think four of his first five were Lennon McCartney yeah. songs. Yeah, they were because I I, I remember to actually interviewing Billy J. You know, going back a couple of years, and yeah. he lives in New York now. Anyway, I was chatting to him. We, we skyped him through, and he actually said to me that you know bands without the Beatles, he says, including myself, without the Beatles, uh, you know, the bands wouldn't have got any further than anything that they were doing back in Liverpool, just around the clubs. And I, I couldn't get my head around what he was actually saying. And I didn't like to like pursue what he was saying. And uh, with that, you know, with, with the likes of refusing the Denisons, that is, all my loving, I wonder if he meant, you know, that the bands who refused or, you know, refused to play the likes of uh, or record any of Lennon and McCartney's songs, because he did offer the uh, the songs to them, didn't he? And the Denisons, you know, just fell flat, in my opinion, because of this. Yeah, I, I think they'd have, um, well, you, you never know, but the problem going on to um, a lot of success, if, uh, you know, like Billy Jays and other people who've recorded Silla Black, who've had uh, big hits with uh, uh, Lennon McCartney, Songs, you know, go on, find another couple of good songs, and you really, it's all about momentum. I think. Um, Joe Cocker uh, recorded around this sort of time. Yeah, 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 you're right. With a little elf, yeah, from my friends, yeah. Well, no, before that one, in about 63. Okay. Um, and he, he didn't have any success with it at all. So, you know, they didn't have, uh, it was an automatic guarantee, yeah. but. It was a, a pretty good bet, I think, yeah. uh, to, uh, to to run the back of that. But I think as well the, the Beatles were really important around this sort of time because um, it was pure accident that they, they broke America in a way uh, because uh, Capital, the American um, arm of Parlophone, their record company in the UK, uh, mm. wouldn't release their records. They didn't think they were commercial enough. So a small company called Jay picked them up. Uh, uh, Ed Sullivan was at Heathrow uh, connecting flight and he saw people mainly at first hand and he thought, well, I think I'll have these guys. Yeah, there was that at my airport, wasn't it? Was it, that, he, he, he was, was it he at the airport and he seen this like Beatle mania carrying on or going on at the time and he said, who were these fellas? And all of a sudden, bang, there they are and they're on the Ed Sullivan show. And the Absolutely. Beatles were catapulted into, well, American homes. Exactly. I mean, they'd released about, on, on about three different labels. They'd released um, half a dozen singles by then with no success. Uh, but when they were going on the Ed Sullivan show, Capital and Pick, picked them up. I think uh, they, their first record then took them straight in, pretty much straight into to number one. It's the start of the whole British invasion thing. When a lot of bands like Billy J. Kramer, The Searchers, Dave Clark Five, they all had a lot of success in America. Do, do you know, um, I used to go to the Iron Door. I always went to the Iron Door. And yeah. one of my favourite bands, obviously The Searchers, uh, I, I love The Searchers. I've actually uh, spoken to uh, and interviewed uh, Mike Pender. Uh, yeah. But when I was... Uh, when I was down there at the, the Iron Door, we used to go to the All Nighters. And who used to be on there and was phenomenal, really was phenomenal. The Undertakers were there, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we loved the Undertakers. But the, the fella, and he was outrageous in his dress. I always remember him. 
in this like teddy boy length suit, uh, not suit coat, uh, and it was a, a very loud Scottish check with these tight uh, black trousers on and crepe soles and Rory Storm, and he was just yeah. phenomenal. He was absolutely yeah. brilliant, and the Hurricanes, which yeah. was. Unbelievable to me because, you know, he was the boy, he was the man and, you know, we were just looking at him in awe, to be honest, because yeah. everybody else was, um, you know, like in formal dress, but this fellow was totally different, especially when he came yeah. on stage, you know. And, uh, even yeah. the Undertakers, they were a bit outrageous with their Undertakers, uh, shall I say, uniforms, shall I say. Uh, you know, right. the top hats and the, the long uh, coats, the morning coats, shall we call them. But it was us as yeah, exactly. uh, young teenagers who, who were looking at these people, these fantastic people. So what you were saying before about uh, the Beatle era, uh, sorry, the Mersey Beat era was phenomenal during the 60s. And this was the capital of music. Uh, forget anywhere else. Forget the likes of... Uh, you know, London or Manchester or anywhere else. This was the place to be. Yeah, it certainly was. And I mean, you had some uh, really powerful uh, stage presences as well. I mean, people like uh, King Size Taylor. Oh yeah, uh, King Size Taylor. Yeah, but he's got a phenomenal voice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, it's it's strange here because I'm actually looking at the. Like, like the escorts, you said about the, the escorts. And Terry to Sylvester actually went over to the Hollies. Now, the Hollies was one of my favourite bands. And then Graham yeah. Nash left, didn't he? And Terry That's Sylvester right. went into uh, this thing. And, and Terry became one of these, which surprised me what you've actually said. I'd rather you tell them that what he actually went into, uh, you know, with the Hollies, into the Hall of Fame. That's right. Um, he uh, on his website, he claims that he is the only Liverpool um, artist who's been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, apart from, uh, from the Beatles. Ah, that, that's that's that shocked me. It, it hasn't surprised yeah. me. It's actually shocked me because you know we've been mentioning from the likes of Jerry and the Pacemakers to uh, the Searchers, which th these bands were phenomenal, and yet, and yet. Uh, they're not in the the, 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 the records uh, or Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just the Beatles and Terry Sylvester with the Hollies most probably yeah that's right I mean he, he's had um, quite an interesting career as well because he actually left uh, the escorts to join the Swinging Blue Jeans yeah so he's with uh, a couple of different bands uh, there the, the Swing and Blue Jeans were fans, fantastic as well. You know, there's so many, isn't there, really? Uh, you know, you've got the chance. And quite a lot. Everything, you know, it's just uh, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. We've got a great legacy, haven't we, uh, really, you know, here on Merseyside and the Mersey Beat era, the legacy that we've left. Very much so. I mean, it... it <coughs> So many um, good bands. Uh, you, you, you could talk, well, all night. You could talk all week about them. And the, the other thing that was interesting was uh, Mersey Beat magazine. Um, that started out, uh, well, the 6th of July, 1961, was the first edition. It was uh, driven by a guy called Harry. And because what he wanted to do was to uh, really document and promote the, the, sea, the local scene around the, the various uh, areas, basically. And a, a sort of picture of a policeman came into his mind. And I always thought that was, was great. Because I've never found a, a definitive definition as to where uh, the origin of the either, either beat music or uh, Mersey Beat comes from. So it could well be that uh, Mersey Beat magazine was instrumental. Because that was going in the very early 60s, really before the Beatles were, uh, were anywhere outside of um, Liverpool. Because then they were being promoted very much uh, on a magazine called Mersey Beat. I, I wouldn't mind betting that was quite instrumental in how the, uh, the concept uh, its way um, around the world, really. Now, you know, everybody talks about um, Mersey Beat. 
But you know what? So, you, you surprised me there because I always thought it was the mazy beat, you know, the beat of, uh, you know, the music and everything else. But I didn't yeah. realize that, you know, it was a different kind of beat, which is like walking the beat. I feel like absolutely amazing. Well, that was where Bill, that was where Bill Harry got his, his idea from. But I think what it, it then became, as exactly as you say, uh, they were called the Beatles um, by then. And I think the, the word beat really just uh, picked up uh, picked up a momentum. Someone somewhere picked that one up, and before you know it, you know you've got a you've got an expression. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell you another thing, and I must have seen these. I must have seen this fella because I always remember a school prom dance, shall I say, school prom dance. And right. um, I was watching the Denisons. The Denisons were the star guests, you know. And one of the the lads said to me. Ask him to play uh, some other guy. Ask him to sing some other guy. So I went over and said, "Will you sing some other guy?" And he went, "Yeah." And some other guy. And I was thinking, "My love, all way from brilliant, absolutely brilliant." Anyway, uh, you've got here that uh, uh, Clive Ormby was the actual drummer, and Clive Ormby, as everybody knows, uh, played Jack Sugden in Emmerdale Farm, and I didn't know that at all. That's right. Uh, he became Jack Sugden in 1980, and he was there till 2008. Yeah, that's so right. Better known. Yeah, yes. that's right. Well, he's passed on, hasn't he now, uh, 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 Clive Ormby? But I didn't know that he was a scouser or a Mersey side. I really didn't know, and that that, that, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that surprised me a great deal. I'll tell you, the, you know, with, with the likes of, um, you know, a little thing that you've sent through, uh, you know, the mojos, and I didn't know about Lewis Collins because I remember going down to the uh, the Iron Door and seeing yeah. these fellas play, and I didn't know about Lewis Collins. Uh, was he a drummer? Was he a drummer or, or what? I think, I, I, think the bassist. I think he was a bass guitarist. Oh, the bass guitarist, and then he went on to, uh, play. well, he, he became a, a film star, a TV star, then film star. Uh, you know, he, right. he, 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 he phenomenal, and unfortunately, he's passed on, and he, he went to live in LA, didn't he? But you know, the likes of That's these right. lads uh, who who I actually seen. I, I'll, ju I'll, I'll just digress a little from the what I mean. What this is what I mean. I remember going to the uh, to the boxing stadium, you know, here in Liverpool, and the boxing stadium, which might interest you. Yeah. Uh, it was the very first purpose-built boxing stadium in the whole of the country. Anyway, right. uh, I I went down. I used to go and watch the old boxing, and uh, well, I was dragged down to see you know the boxing, and I never yeah. ever went to see any wrestling. But what I did go to see when they started to bring them on was uh, the big bands at the time, and this was around 1971, 72, or something like that. And I went down to see the Mojos and Hawkwind because I was well into yeah. Hawkwind wow. and um, yeah. the Mojos, you know, all the young dudes and things like that. Anyway, uh, someone said to me, someone sent a message through to me saying, uh, when I was talking about this, that he was there on the night, you know, this particular person, and who was on the band, he said, do you know what, Frank, he said, y you never mentioned he was a, one of the support bands, and that was Queen. Now, I seen every oh, band, right. I seen every band that night, uh, Derek, and yeah. I must have seen Queen, because I always remember saying to the, 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 the girl I was with at the time, I said, do you know what, I said, they were all brilliant, weren't they? I said, everyone was brilliant, all the bands. She says, yeah, they were fantastic. So it must have been Queen as well that I was saying, you know, they were all brilliant or great and everything yeah. else. So isn't that wonderful, though? And it's just like this now, what we're talking about. You know, there's bands that I actually seen on the Iron Door who were absolutely phenomenal and became phenomenal anyway. And not only that, but also became... The likes of Lewis Collins, the likes of uh, Clive Ormby, you know, went on to do other things. Yeah. It's just absolutely... And Terry Sylvester, you know, must have been seeing him as well, and that little did I know that 
one of my favourite bands yeah. was the Hollies, and because we, we yeah. never had the technology then, or you know, if you all oh, right, you pick up the the the, 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 the Maisie beat and start reading that, and uh, or, do you understand? Um, it, it just. You don't know these things. You just don't know these things. And and Farron's Flamingos, we were chatting about Farron's Flamingos, and they all of a sudden, yeah. they just split. They just split up. And, yeah. you know, we didn't know why they split up, because they were only together for a couple of years or so, weren't they? And yet they were phenomenal. That's right, yeah. I mean, they, they, they started out as a band called The, uh, the Ravens, uh, but I mean, they they were a, a tremendous band. I'd say it's it, just the luck of the draw, really, in a, a, a lot of ways. If they um, had been successful, then they might well have had um, a version of uh, uh, "Do You Love Me" at number one instead of "Pool," and who knows? And they might have gone on to uh, mature into a you know a, a real good long term band. Yeah, but, but it, you, it's strange what you're saying. The thing about that is. We, no, I'm just saying there, you know, about uh, Brian Poole and the Tremlows. Yeah. And Do You Love Me? Not Do You Love Me, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there was Do You Love Me, wasn't it? Do You That's Love right, yeah. Me? Do You yeah. Love Me? Now, I remember, and I'm thinking about it now, uh, seeing them on the telly, or, I think it was on uh, Thank You Lucky Stars or something like that, and this is all before we went out on a Saturday night. And, right. you know, seeing them there and Brian Poole there singing away. And you're so right. And again, it's only what uh, 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 Billy J. Kramer said to me about, you know, people not taking that opportunity. And, if, you know, yeah. hindsight's a wonderful thing. But unfortunately, there were some bands that didn't have the vision. And there were some bands who did have right. vision. And, uh, you know, uh, went on to uh, stardom. That's right. And some bands have varied careers as well. I mean, you look at another good band of that era, uh, the Remo Four. The Remo uh, Four they, yeah. they started uh, way back as well as a sort of um, instrumental group before Johnny Sandon joined them. Because Johnny Sandon was originally the lead singer with the Searchers, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Because uh, Mike Pender told me that, actually. That's strange. Yeah, the Searchers back with his... Uh, they were his backing band, and he he, he, he split from them, and he joined uh, the Remo Four, and they were by uh, Brian Epstein uh, at that particular time. But that didn't really uh, work out too well. Tommy Quickly, who was one of Brian Epstein's uh, prodigies, he, I remember at the time he worked really hard to try and break uh, Tommy Quickly. They had about five singles uh, mm-hmm. with the Remo Four, and uh, never really quite cracked it. I think Tommy. Uh, Tommy Quickly's another guy, I think, who um, got disillusioned with the business and and um, moved on. Did he just it, walk away from music altogether? Because, you know, Tommy Quickly was think a so. big name at the time. Oh, he was. He, he, I mean, he was massive locally. Um, and Epstein was riding the crest of a wave, to say the least. And he was. I remember the, reading articles around it at the time and things like the NME. Um, how Brian Epstein, you know, this is my next big uh, uh, act as it were, and it, it just never happened. But the Remo 4 went on to, to, to interesting things after that, because then when, after Tommy you know, quickly left, they went back to just being the Remo 4, uh, but it then included the, a guy called Tony Ashton, keyboard player, and a drummer called Ron Dyke, who went on to and Garber and Dyke, and one hit wonder with Resurrection Shuffle. I don't know if you remember, remember yeah, that one. But. Yeah, of course, it's a, yeah, the Resurrection Shuffle, yeah, certainly do. Because they went on as well to actually back um, George Harrison, on his first album, Wonder War Music. Yeah, uh, uh, now isn't that isn't that fantastic? Isn't that fantastic? Because yeah. you know, as you said, hey, you know, you've got all these wonderful uh, names and everything else that are uh, 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 that was so so well up there in the music business. The likes of uh, Howie Casey, for example. They were oh, unbelievable. And Freddie Star, you've even got Freddie Star, you know, on vocals. Uh, with uh, right. Howie Casey and the seniors, uh, yeah. it, it, it's it's absolutely amazing, you know. And King Size Taylor and the Dominoes was uh, I seen them, I actually seen yeah. them, which yeah, and seen they them. were as you said, as you said, he had a, a, such a presence, didn't he? You know, on stage, oh, absolutely amazing. 
But that Owen Casey, you know, he did a hell of a lot, didn't he? You know, going yeah. through everything, you know, from different bands to the crew. I remember the crew as well. But they they, they just yeah. like didn't he disappear somewhere and and, and just went off the it just went off, didn't he? You know, I don't know what happened to them unless yeah. they went abroad. And... Yeah, they, 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 they did. They went to uh, France for a few years, two or three years or something. I think they they, they were together till around 69, I think. Because mm. they, they were uh, being put together on Marston's backing band, but uh, that they didn't work out for some reason. Do you know what, though? You, you just mentioned a magical name there, Beryl Marston. I think she was the best female singer in the old of the Mersey Beat era, in my opinion. Without doubt. I mean, she's another one that's, you know, it, it given the right break, uh, the right uh, record, she, she'd have been enormous. Yeah. I mean, she she was. I mean, I'd, I'd agree 100% there. It's and a, she was no relation to Jerry either. <laughs> uh, do you know what, though? It, it is a client's shame, you know, because yeah. you, you, you've got these... Phenomenal people, and I'm talking of. I'm going back to the escorts, I'm going back to the Denisons, I'm going back to everyone. Who, in my opinion, my opinion, should have made a fans flamingos. You know, should have made it. They really should have made it. Yeah. These bands at the time, and they should have been become much bigger than they were. Because all oh, right, they were big here in Liverpool, the, the Merseyside uh, 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 area, but unfortunately. Not national or international, and yet they were there phenomenal. Even the, the, even the yeah, Beatles be, themselves, Lennon, you know, Lennon had great respect yeah. for some of the bands as well, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they um, were sort of helped out. He was saying earlier, you know, Paul, Paul McCartney was known to play tambourine here and there. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. it was just the wrong decision at the time. I mean, King Size Taylor um, and the Doors, I mean, a phenomenal band. Uh, one of the best at the at the time, uh, but around 1962 they went off um, to Germany and they spent most of 62 to 64 in Germany, so they really missed out on the um, the Mersey Beats, well the, the British invasion because I mean that started around early 64 and the yeah. bands that made it were the were established, uh, the, you know the Searchers, Jake Kramer, um, and uh, you know the likes of the Kinks and. Um, well, he, he had no way of knowing how big it would be because, he, you know, only hindsight would um, would give you that. But he sort of missed out on it. Yeah. Yeah. His version of stupidity is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Because they returned to the UK in about 64 for Chuck Berry's tour. Yeah. He came over to the UK for the first time yeah. in 64. But apparently they split up shortly after that. And a quote I've seen a couple of times is the reason that um, King Size Taylor and the Domino's Party Company was that they had a quarrel that was so trivial that no one could remember what it was about. Oh. And how well, many times has that happened with, I'm, I'm not just saying yeah. about local bands, but, you know, other bands as well, uh, like the Beatles themselves, you know, the, the, the split there was phenomenal, and yet they had so much music to offer. It's it's yeah. it's such a crying shame that these people actually split up. Yeah. Even the Everly Brothers split up, didn't they? Even uh, Simon well, and they, Garfunkel, I, they split up. Yeah, well, yeah. they hated each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's strange. That because I was watching a concert uh, recently uh, of both the likes of uh, Simon and Garfunkel and um, and uh, the Everly Brothers. And the body language was a, it was it was terrible. And even uh, the Righteous Brothers, by the way, uh, you know, the body language out of them, and, and it must be coming, you know, must have been coming to that time when, you know, they'd been yeah. arguing off stage, and then they had to appear on stage, you know, together for the for the concert. But you could see the uh, the body language out of the, you know, the lot of them, and that that's such a shame. That's such a shame, you know, because music is definitely lost forever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was a famous concert in, in um, Central Park, I think it was, Simon and Garfunkel, and they got together because it, it, they're both going to make a very large amount of money. Out yeah, that, I was and just going think, to say that, actually, because they were offered a, a phenomenal sum each, each. Yeah. 
uh, that would have tried them for life, you know what I mean? Well, set them up for life. Well, not that, you know, it, well, all right, it was an offer they couldn't refuse, put it that way. Yeah, Paul Simon actually walked off stage when they did Bridge Over Troubled Water because he doesn't sing on it. <laughs> Apparently, he just walked off stage and yeah. our, our, our uncle performed it as a solo solo piece. Yeah. It's a bit yeah. sad, really. I think it Paul is Simon sad. could have it joined it. It is sad. And, uh, and that's, the, that, that, that's the way, it's the way life is, isn't it, really? It's like, uh, absolutely, you know, like a, a couple getting divorced. And, you know, sometimes, like, couples do get back together and they say, don't they, isn't it a shame yeah. that we split up the first time and what was it all about? And as you said, I forget who you're talking about now, unfortunately, uh, you said, you know, they, they had an argument and they said, what was it about? It was that trivial, that you know, that they split up and when they started talking, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they said we don't even know what it's about, and it's a shame. Yeah, yeah. As you say, it's the uh, it's the way of the world. But the Everly Brothers famously split up on stage. Yeah, they had a blazing argument on yeah. stage. It must have been a continuing argument, yeah. and I forget which one it was. One of them just walked off, and the other the other one stayed on stage and finished the set. Yeah. That must have been a, a sight to behold. Well, it must have been. I'm sure that was the show I was watching, and it was only a, a while back as well. It yeah. wasn't like years ago or months ago. It was just a, a while. Yeah. Because I've got these, like, channels, and, you know, you put them on, and there you see these things that you don't expect. And, and there was the Everly Brothers, you know, and uh, unbelievable. And they just showed you these three, uh, you know... As I said, the Righteous Brothers, um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, and uh, the Everly Brothers, you know, and, and, and you could see the body language in them. But, you know, it was a documentary and he was saying, look at this, look how Phil Elverly is there, and, and the way he's looking over at, you know, the other fella. And it, it, it was just phenomenal. And even Simon and Garfunkel, because uh, Paul Simon, you know, you could see him looking as the other fella's singing. Oh, Garfunkel. And it was like daggers. It was like daggers, you know, and yep. how mad it was, you know. So it's so sad, isn't it? It really is. It is, I think, as well, with people like Simon and Garfunkel, because they were a wonderful combination. I mean, Paul Simon was a superb um, songwriter yep. and uh, arranger. Mark Garfunkel had the most amazing um, voice, complemented yep. by... Uh, Paul Simons, yeah. um, but again, it's a it's a bit like the Beatles, where the the whole is that much greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. So you know, when people like that split up, I think it's a it's a double shame in a in a way. Of course, it is. I think one of the most famous uh, splits, in, in my opinion, and uh, you know, these were great entertainers, but they weren't like in groups or whatever. And it was the Rat Pack, you know, with the likes of yeah. Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin. You know, these wonderful yeah. people, even Peter Lawford, who couldn't sing a note anyway, <laughs> and uh, Joey Bishop, you know, they were phenomenal, this, you know, this rap pack. And, you know, you know that when they, when they split as well, it, 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 you know, it was a crying shame because these are iconic people, iconic, whether it's through entertainment or whether it's through anything, you know, to be honest. And uh, it's... it's Derek, we've just come out of time. I'm awfully sorry. It's been absolutely wonderful again, mind-boggling. And, you know, most probably, you know, the feedback after the show will be phenomenal. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, obviously, you'll, you'll be coming on again with us. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. It's uh, really enjoyed talking to you, Frank. Well, listen, really you, what, what's your fancy talking about the next time? Because tonight's um, been absolutely well, it might fantastic. Be um, it might be worth having a look at um, some of the sort of background people, um, the Moon the Shakers, people like um, Sam Leach, um, oh, yeah. Alan Williams, yeah. uh, Brian Epstein, outside of the Beatles, because yeah, he, yeah. he had a, Bob Woolley. Uh, he got involved in an awful lot of stuff. Bob Woolley. So, the, you, know, that, the, 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 you know, the people who... Uh, uh, Jim Island, is it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They're all really interesting. They're the guys that made it all happen. You know, they managed the bands, they promoted the bands, 
and managed they, the clubs as well. Don't forget, clubs. you know the likes of the Cavern and the well, even um, even Jason's uh, uh, uncle. He owned the Iron Door, and I've been trying wow. to get him on the. I, I met him uh, once. I, I was at a unfortunately, I was at a funeral, and, and, and that's where you meet people at funerals. And I yeah. was saying to him. Will you come on the show? But he's a very shy person, and Jason, unfortunately, has been trying to get him on. And I said, we'd even go down to your house and interview you there, because he's got so so many wonderful stories about the Iron Door and some of the great artists that were there. Yeah, and it's such a shame, really, yeah. but at least, you know, we've got you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to go through you, yeah, you know, to uh, get all these stories uh, out. But yeah, that'll be absolutely fantastic if we could talk about the likes of uh, Epstein, the likes of uh, Mr. Williams. As a, I've got to tell you this, I walked in, you know, and um, uh, it was in the grapes, and it was, I'm only going back about three or four summers ago, and um, I. Alan was there, you know, I seen Alan, I said, listen, it was only a couple of us, I said, are you coming in, it was a lovely uh, afternoon and sunny and warm, and I was in Matthew Street, and I said, yeah, I'll come in, I said, uh, and have a drink with us, Alan, he said, hey, yes, of course, Frank, so anyway, we goes in, and um, I'm, I'm saying, and I was getting the bevy in, I was getting the rounds in, and I said to the lads, you know, what do you want, I said, what do you want, I said, what do you want, I said, and I went over, and I went, you know, I was saying their names, and I went over, and I looked at Alan, and Alan looked at me, and I went, what do you want? And he went, he's forgotten my expletive name. Frank has forgotten <laughs> my expletive name. I said, I haven't. And he said, what is it? And do you know what I'm saying? That It went blank. My mind's went blank. <laughs> You know, so uh, every time I met him after that, we used to have a little laugh about it, you know. <laughs> but it's such a shame yeah. that, uh, you know, again, you know, he's left us. But, uh, yeah, it would be fantastic talking about these uh, lads who made it all happen. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, Frank, mate. All the best. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, right, look forward to the next time. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Well, that was... Uh, that was Derek Shelmer doing. It wasn't it a fantastic, fantastic uh, interview there because he brought it to life. You know what was happening with the bands and these most obscure bands who we all loved. You know, people especially here going down to see in the clubs and everywhere else that they appeared, even on the town hall and you know these uh, dance halls and everywhere. It wasn't just the uh, the clubs like the Iron Door or the Cavern or anything like that. They were at dance halls as well, which was absolutely f phenomenal at the time. So the next time we'll be talking about the likes of Alan Williams, the likes of Bob Woolett, the likes of uh, Sam Leach, you know, these wonderful people who made everything happen. So looking forward to that. I'll tell you what, we'll play a nice little song. And how about uh, a couple of songs by um, again you know from the the, the, the Mersey Beat era The Chance King Size Sailor and the Dominoes and the Mojos who, who, who we've just been talking about with uh, with Derek so She's Mine Stupidity and Everything's Alright by those and there we go with them the best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune into Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8pm here only on Mersey Radio.